So a, a slight feeling of deja vu this morning. And here we go again. Um, so yeah, it was, it was great to be asked to come and speak about interesting things that are happening in CSS because I am very, very nerdy about CSS. And so I've got lots of things that I think are fascinating and that I'm going to share with you today. Um, some are immediately useful, others you might have to wait a little while to start to use, but I think you might be surprised how much browser support there is for a lot of this new stuff. And I'm going to start with layout, because that's actually my very favorite subject. Um, and I'm going to start with a module that you might not have heard the name of, but you're probably already using. If you're using Flexbox, you already know about this. This is Box Alignment Level 3. And it appears that for a very long time, um, vertical centering has been the hardest problem in web design. Um, and that's kind of been solved by Flexbox to some extent. Um, one of the big reasons that we use Flexbox is just to get alignment. Um, so we don't have to mess around with auto margins and things. So this is a Flexbox example. We're using align items and justify content to center the image vertically and horizontally. And those properties are part of the Flexbox spec. And all of my slides have got um, code links and things. I'll be publishing the slides later so you can go through and have a look at all of these examples. So we use that code and we end up with this. In the second example, I've got a flex layout where the height of the flex container is defined by the taller image. And then using the Flexbox alignment properties to align the landscape images inside that flex container. And I'm using align self here to align the individual items. So for Flexbox, we've got align self center, um, flex start, and flex end to align inside that flex container. So Flexbox is pretty cool. And so what the box alignment specification does is it takes all of those neat alignment properties, puts them into a separate specification. And what that means is that we can use them with other specifications. So at some point in the future, some great and glorious point, you'll be able to float something and also use those alignment properties on it, which would be marvelous. Um, but we're already starting to see these properties used in another spec. Um, the box alignment spec, so it's a set of six properties that control alignment of boxes within other boxes. And here they are. And you'll be familiar with those if you have used Flexbox. As I say, we're already starting to get the ability to use those somewhere else. But again, it's a spec you've probably not played around with so much because it's the new CSS grid layout spec. Now, I have entire hour-long talks. Um, I spent my workshop uh, two days ago. A lot of the time of that, I was talking about CSS grid layout. It's a massive spec. Um, I'm going to show you a few edited highlights, but I'm going to start with explaining how those alignment properties from Flexbox have ended up in grid layout. So this is the same example, the, the four image example uh, that I created with the flex layout. Here I am creating a grid layout. I'm using grid template columns. I'm saying repeat four times one fraction unit. This fraction unit, this FR, is a fantastic unit. It allows us to distribute available space. So we're saying we've got, we've split the available space in the grid container into four um, and share it out equally because they've all got one fraction unit of space. And so we get the same layout as we had with that flex layout. This time, I'm using CSS grid layout to do the layout. So grid, it brings us a kind of fit for purpose layout method for the first time. And it's designed to work alongside Flexbox and other layout methods. And it's a huge spec. And the idea of grid is that it's for two dimensional layout. Flexbox is for single dimensional layout. You want to lay things out in a row or as a column, you want Flexbox. If you want to do both at once, that's where you need grid. As we've already seen, if we say display grid, we start laying things out on the grid. All of the child items, all the direct children of that um, wrapper element are then going to become grid items, same as you have with Flexbox. And here I'm creating a three column grid. I'm just using one fraction unit, one fraction unit, one fraction unit there. And then we've got grid gap to make a gutter between those items. And so any child elements, they lay out on the grid, one in each cell of the grid. Now, if we were to do this with Flexbox, we'd say display flex. We'd say flex wrap wrap. Um, we'd give the things a flex basis so that they wrapped. And we'd end up with this. And the two items at the bottom would be splitting the space. And we'd end up with two large items. There's not an easy way to say, oh, you two items at the bottom. If there's only two of you, could you line up? underneath the items above. And that's because with Flexbox, 
space distribution happens on a row by row or column by column basis. So you have a new flex container essentially as you wrap onto a new row and the space is distributed on that container. So that's really the difference between grid and flex box. This is one dimensional layout. We're treating each row as an individual thing. With grid, we've got the whole container and we put items into it. The nice thing with the flex example though, is as we know with Flexbox, you can say, well, I'd like my flex basis to be sort of 250 pixels. And so uh, Flexbox will add as many um, columns, it'll let you have as many items in as will fit into the container. And if you make the container narrower, they'll wrap onto the next line. That's quite nice. We can actually do that with grid because of a new function for track sizing that's been created for grid layout. It's this min max function. So here I'm saying, Grid template columns, create my columns, um, as many columns as will autofill, so we can fill as many as we can into the container. I would like them to have a minimum of 200 pixels and a maximum of one fraction unit. And so what this does is it says the minimum size is 200 pixels, so we can't go smaller than that. We'll get as many 200 pixel columns as we can. That leftover space, because the maximum is one fraction unit, we'll just share it out amongst the columns. So we get this nice ability to have as many columns as will fit, but also have things line up in their columns as well. So min max is incredibly useful. Um, there's lots of things in grid layout that we can do with this uh, functionality. So one of the things that you see in layouts is you get these nice precise layouts like this one on the Toots Plus website. Um, you've got these nice little boxes, you often use them for navigation. The problem with those is in the real world, um, Things come from content management systems, and people add, add more content than the designer ever imagined into the little boxes, and then it all breaks. And it doesn't matter what you do, you try and restrict it, it it's, it's not going to work. You get very fragile layouts if you're saying, this has to be this tall. Um, MinMax is the secret to getting these kind of layouts to work in a really robust way using Grid. So I took this kind of layout and I created my own. It looks a bit like this. Um, we've got three breakpoints here, so I've got a mobile size one, and then I've got a sort of wider one, um, and then a, a very wide layout. And I fixed the height of those boxes so that in my design, um, my ideal sort of design is to have these nice neat rows of a certain size, no matter how much content is in them. However, if someone comes along and adds far too much content into one of those boxes, as they have in the news article about angry people at Bloom Fiestas there, um, someone's come along, they've added too much stuff, and the box has expanded down, but so have the, two, the, the whole row has expanded, so the two images next have also got taller, they've also absorbed extra space, which means that my layout doesn't break. Now, the designer probably wants the, the small box, and they would prefer it was like that, but obviously we'd much prefer that the layout doesn't break if someone comes along and adds too much content. So this is how we're doing that. We're using min-max in the track sizing, this time for rows. Um, and grid auto rows means that when grid creates new rows to add content, uh, if you haven't explicitly defined some rows, it's going to create them with a minimum size of 150 pixels. So even if we've just got a little heading in that box, it'll still be 150 pixels tall, which is what the designer wanted. But then we're saying the maximum size is auto, and auto takes its size from the content, so there's always going to be enough room for whatever content ends up in there. Um, you can take a look at that full example once you have uh, Wi-Fi. There's lots of little bits and pieces in there that are pretty neat and show how Grid really is going to solve a lot of the problems that we actually have when we're building web designs um, and we're building things that have content that comes from all over the place that we don't have control of. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of stuff that you can do with Grid to cope with that and actually build really elegant designs that have tolerance for the real world. So staying with grid for a little while, more coolness is around grid auto placement. We've already seen that when we declare something to be a grid, all of the child elements become grid items and they will just lay themselves out on the grid without you doing anything. We can actually play with that ability and set rules for certain items in our layout uh, and let grid deal with the others. So, I'm from the past, all that music was very much like the school discos um, of, of my youth. 
Um, and the other thing that I like to remember is that we had that we had, had 216 colours at one point. Now, as a developer, I was quite happy when there were 216 colours. It gave me less to worry about, um, you know, and, and two fonts. I'd be quite happy with all that. That was great. Um, so I've made this chart of web safe colours from the past, and I've just sort of set those up with a list, and I'm going to make the this into a, a grid layout. So I'm laying out my colours on a grid. I've said display grid. I've said grid template columns, and I'm auto filling as many 80 pixel minimum width columns as I can, and I'm going to create rows that also are 80 pixels tall with a max of auto, and that gives me this. So I've got all my items. So grid is just laying those out. They're each a list item. So grid is just laying them out into the columns and rows that we've created. So then I add a few classes. I've decided that I'd like the white and the black blocks to spread right across the screen. So I'm saying start at grid column line one, which is the far left column, and end at minus one, which would be the far right, because I'm working in a left to right language. That would actually be switched if we were working right to left. I've also then created some classes which I've just applied fairly arbitrarily around um, the list. So we've got some that span two tracks and some that span three column tracks, and we've got some that um, span several row tracks. So we can create some different sized blocks here. And then we get this. And you can see there are some sort of black spaces in the grid. So what's happening here is grid's doing its auto placement thing, it's laying out the blocks, it sometimes comes to a point where we've got a block which is too big to fit on the end of that row. And so Grid just says, OK, there's not space for that. We'll move to the next row and carry on laying them out. So we get these gaps, especially where we've got the very big um, images the item stretched right across. We've got all these gaps left in the Grid, unless we use a property called Grid Auto Flow and set the value to Dense, which enables a dense packing mode. Grid is now progressing through the, the layout it finds an item that it can't fit, so it finds the next place to put that item, but then the next item it comes across, if it knows there's a gap big enough for that item to fit in, it picks it up, it takes it out of source order, and it puts it into the gap, which is very, very cool if you've got a bunch of things that have no logical order. It is not so good for your form. <laughs> Which is why the default for this uh, value, for this property, is going to be sparse, which means stay in source order, please. It is also why it sort of highlights the fact that with CSS grid layout, as with Flexbox to some extent, and you will see more of this later today from Leone, there are some very present dangers with regard to accessibility of our content and reordering of content and creating an almighty mess. Uh, so with great power, which Grid and, you know, and Flexbox give us, there certainly comes some responsibility on our part and as our part as a community to have these discussions and work out how we work with this stuff and also ensure the accessibility of what we're doing. As I say, you'll be hearing a bit more about that from Leone later. Um, if you've liked the look of these Grid things that I have been showing you, I have lots and lots of information. In terms of browsers, this page on my site, gridbyexample.com, details the current state of browser support. Um, very quickly, Grid came from the Microsoft team. There is an old implementation in IE 10, 11, and Edge. It is outdated now because they are not going to update until the final spec ships. The spec is pretty much finished. Um, we have pretty full implementations of Grid layout in both Firefox and Chrome, and also in, um, in WebKit. So it's out there in the Safari Tech and Preview browser. It's quite likely that Grid will land in browsers unflagged um, early next year. And at that point, probably about 60% of the web will have Grid layout in their browser, and it works. Um, at the moment, you can enable flags and have a play around with all of my examples. I've got lots on that site. So moving on from Grid, but staying with layout. In Flexbox and in the current Grid implementations, uh, things have to be a direct child of the element that we say display Grid or display Flex on for them to become part of that layout method. Now, Grid layout does have a subgrid keyword in the spec, which would mean that things that weren't direct children, so something, for instance, the list items of a list, if the list was a direct child, the list items could also become, use the same grid that you've defined uh, with subgrid. That hasn't been implemented by anyone. I'm not sure it will. It may well get bumped to level two of the spec. But there's another value of display that can kind of get around this problem a bit, and that's display contents. 
Um, this does something very interesting. Um, if you set something to display contents, it stops generating boxes, which means that, for instance, your UL element um, stops generating the box around it, and so the list items themselves can act as if they're direct children of the thing that you've de um, declared display grid on. So it allows our indirect children to become flex or grid items, which is pretty neat. So let's see how this works. So I've got some markup here. I've got a wrapper. It's got a bunch of direct children, the heading, the paragraphs. We've got a block quote with a class of inset. We've then got this UL, and it's got some list items inside. So the UL is a direct child. The list items are children of that, so they're not direct children. And I'm creating a two-column grid layout here, and I'm setting the direct children, so the H1, the paragraphs. I'm setting them to span right across the grid. Uh, the block quote is going in uh, after column line one, and the following paragraph goes after column line two, which gives me this. So you can see we've got the block quote and the following paragraph are defining the, the, the two uh, columns of the grid. Um, and then we've got those two images which are inside the UL. And now the UL is falling into the first track because that's how wash placement works. It's placed the direct child. What we'd really like is those two images to line up underneath the block quote and the paragraph above. And we can do that with display contents. So that UL has got a class of images, so I use the display property on that class and give it a value of contents. The effect of this is that that UL element is no longer in the DOM in terms of box generation. So the two LI elements are now treated as grid items, and we get this. And they now line up with the quote and the paragraph above. So that's really useful. You can use that with flex and grid items. It's currently um, implemented in Firefox, so you can have a look at my examples in Firefox. It is also now been implemented in Blink, so hopefully that's going to end up in Chrome before too long. I'd love to have proper subgrid support ultimately in grid layout, but I think a lot of common use cases, you know, like that one, will be solved, solved by using display contents. So we'll move away from some of those big layout things and look at some interesting things that, for design. We've got CSS Shapes, which is a lovely little specification. It came from Adobe. And what Shapes lets us do is wrap text or whatever you like around things other than a rectangular shape. So we get away from everything being little boxes in web design. So to use Shapes, you have to float the item in the current uh, spec. You float the item, and then you use this Shape Outside property. Here I'm using shape outside, I'm saying circle, there's a bunch of functions, you use circle ellipse, you can use polygon. Um, so circle 50% because I just want to make a circle from the, the center of the circle and that gives me this, which is pretty nice. You don't have to use an image. Um, I'm, you see all these examples, they tend to use images because that's you know, we want to curve our text around images, you don't need to. What you do need to have is something to float. So you could float some generated content though. Um, and use the shape on that. And then we get our circle in the text. So you could do some kind of curvy text effect. You don't need to have an image in there. Um, you can just float some generated content. Something else which is pretty nice is that the, um, you can use clip path, which is a different property, but it takes the same values as shapes. And what clip path lets you do is clip away content from an image uh, based on that shape. So here I'm saying shape outside ellipse. I'm using the ellipse function to create an elliptical shape. I'm also using clip path and the, the prefix uh, WebKit one, which you need uh, for, for WebKit at the moment. And that gives us this. And that's actually a, you know, a normal landscape image with a whole load of blue sky on it. And I'm clipping away the blue sky with clip path uh, to follow my shape, which is pretty nice. That's browser support for shapes. You can see that we have this in Chrome. We've got it in Safari. Um, Firefox have sent their intent to implement, which means they are going to break ground in it. They're going to implement this in the browser. So the nice thing with shapes is it's a really lovely progressive enhancement. You know, you can do a lot of stuff with shapes because it's applied to floats. For instance, if you've got um, your conference website, you've got a bunch of speaker images, uh, you could use shapes to put them in a circle and to wrap the text around. Anyone who doesn't have shapes is going to get the square images. That's okay. But the people who have got shapes, they see the, uh, the, the round images and the kind of design that you really wanted. So it's a nice progressive enhancement, which is fun. Sometimes 
you might use shapes in a way that could cause, for instance, your text to fall over a background image because of the way you're curving it um, around the part of the image that's got some white space. That wouldn't be so good. But CSS has already come up with a way for you to deal with this. Anyone here using Modernizer? Has used Modernizer, know what it is? Excellent, right, feature queries, that's Modernizer right there in your CSS. So we've got this at supports rule. It's a conditional rule and it tests whether the user agent supports um, CSS property value pair. So you can basically find out whether the browser supports the CSS you're about to use and then use it. So very similar to using a media query to find out how big a screen is before you do something. Now, the thing is, with these feature queries, they've got fantastic browser support. And they're supported by all the newer browsers. And what this means is that if we want to use this for progressive enhancement, pretty much any new thing that shows up in CSS from today onwards, you can use feature queries to figure out whether you've got support for it. And then you can do something else, and you can use your feature query, and you can actually then test and do your new CSS inside the feature query. So this is how this works. So here I'm having a look to see if the browser supports grid layout. So I just say at supports, display grid. And then inside my feature query, I can do whatever I want to do if the browser has got grid layout support. And we can test for more than one thing. So we can look to see if we've got display grid and shape outside circle. So that's really cool, and because it's um, property value, it allows you to test for bits of specifications as well. Now, if you want to know if a browser just generally thinks it's got grid layout support, you could test for display grid. If you knew, for instance, that one browser had implemented subgrid support and you wanted to check for that, well, then you could just look for that part of the spec. You don't need to just look for, for the, main, the whole thing, which is pretty neat. Um, the way to use this is to write CSS for your browsers that don't have support then have your feature query, override anything that you've used for those other browsers, and then do your new shiny CSS. That link is to a great article that Jen Simmons wrote um, on the Mozilla blog, which really goes into detail of how to work with these. I've just got one quick example to sort of show the effect. So this is our clip balloon example from the previous section. So I'm gonna start out by doing some very simple styling. I'm gonna give it a border and some padding. And that's going to give me some layout for browsers that don't support shapes. Uh, so, you know, so it still looks good. And then I have my feature query. I check that we've got all the bits that we need. And I then do the CSS for the shape supporting browser. So if we've got support, we get our clip balloon. And if we don't have support, we get this. So we put a border and some padding on the image. So feature queries are really exciting. And the, the cool thing is that you can actually be using these right now to start playing with some of this early stage CSS that maybe has support in one or two browsers. Um, and also things like Grid that are soon going to have support in a lot of browsers. You can start writing this stuff and start using these things as enhancement. It's brilliant. And the nice thing is it allows you to build these websites that basically enhance themselves as the platform improves without you doing anything. You don't need to ship any code. Once Firefox ships their shape support, Suddenly, all those um, people using Firefox, their browser updates, they get the cool shapes effect without you doing anything. Because you're just saying, does this browser support this feature? If it does, then you can do this stuff. So here's another cool thing, which has only very limited support, but it's neat. Um, we've got initial letter. I think probably most of us at one time or another have tried to create proper drop caps and it's not worked very well despite the fact that we've got this first letter pseudo class. It's quite difficult to get a good drop caps effect. Uh, so initial letter is here to do that and it's defined in the CSS inline layout model spec. And this is how we use it. So I'm targeting the paragraph directly after an H1 and setting the initial letter of that paragraph to bold. <laughs> Um, and I want to have an initial letter that's four lines tall, so that's the first value there, four. Um, and the second value lets you choose how much the uh, letter kind of sticks out the top of the content. So here I'm saying that it, it should be three lines, which means that one line will be out the top of the content, which in a supporting browser, we get this. So that W is four lines tall, um, and it's kind of indented into the content by three lines. <coughs> 
And in a non-supporting browser, of course, well, nothing happens because that's how CSS works. If the browser doesn't support it, it doesn't do anything, uh, which is fine for something like initial letter generally. It will be fine as long as you don't need to do lots of embellishments on that initial letter that are going to be supported when initial letter isn't supported. Because the thing is that this is only Safari 9 at the moment. So a lot of browsers aren't going to get the nice effect. Um, and if perhaps you want to do some kind of crazy things, play around with shapes on your initial letter and make it bold. The problem is that other browsers are going to support all of that stuff apart from initial letter and you're going to end up with something looking a bit weird. <laughs> but we've got a solution for this. We have feature queries so we can test for initial letter support and then we can put the CSS that makes the letter look crazy inside that feature query. So we do it like this and we're saying, if we support initial letter, then do all this stuff. And we end up like this. I'm not sure it's much better, but then I'm not a designer. So, but you get the idea. Um, so feature queries, definitely your new best friend. You know, use them. You can use those. Writing modes. Now, when I became a, a, a CSS working group invited expert and sort of had to sit in on uh, working group calls every week, uh, one of the things that I've discovered is incredibly complicated is writing modes. Um, you know, I kind of knew there was like left to right and right to left, and then there's these characters that go up and down. There's so much complexity uh, wrapped up in writing modes. Um, so there's a specification that deals with this stuff. But you don't just need to use it to display language in you know, other character sets. You can actually use it to mess around with your text and create some quite interesting effects. So I've got an article here with a heading. And I thought, I'm going to lay this article out with grid layout. And I'm going to turn the heading on one side. So there's a few things here. I'm using grid layout again to position the heading. I'm setting the writing mode to vertical RL and flipping it over with a transform which gives us something that looks like this, which is quite a neat trick. Um, but where it's quite useful um, is things like, I was, I was, someone asked me a question, like how could I create this application layout with buttons that run down the side of my screen and the, and the text should be on the side? Well, that's how you do it. You use writing modes. Um, you can use them to, to flip things around and display things in a straight, you know, a different order than they would be. Uh, so that's kind of quite a nice little spec and something that's useful to have in the back of your mind that you can use because it's got pretty good browser support if you want to play around with your text. Now, a couple of things that you might expect to ha happen in a preprocessor rather than in CSS. I think one of the big reasons, probably why anyone starts using a preprocessor at first, the first thing they think is, be really nice to have variables, to be able to define all my colors or my fonts in one place. It's certainly why I started to use preprocessors. Um, just that is a pretty cool thing to be able to do. Um, CSS is now bringing variables actually into native CSS with custom properties. So we can define these author-defined properties. Um, so that's us, authors. We can define our properties, and then we can use them within the CSS. So this is how we do that. It's a very simple example. I'm setting up two colors. So I'm saying I've got a primary and a secondary color. We've got blue and we've got orange. And then we can use them. So I can set my, my level one heading there to use the primary color. You can create custom properties and then test for them. So you can define defaults for browsers that don't support the custom properties. Uh, and then you can use uh, a feature query to check whether custom properties are supported before you start using them. So that's quite useful. And this, not very interesting to look at, but it's a link just to the code pen there, so you can have a, have a look at that example. These custom properties, pretty decent support other than Edge. So we have got you know, quite a bit of support for those. The other reason to use uh, preprocessors really is to do maths and things in, in your CSS. You want to be able to add things up, take things away, take one size away from another. Um, that all works pretty well in the preprocessors. Um, but one of the places where it doesn't work so well is if you want to take, say, an absolute size, like a pixel size, away from something flexible, because the preprocessor doesn't have the context. You don't know like how big 50% is when you're running your preprocessor, because uh, that's reliant on the user's screen. So one of the reasons to use um, calc, which allows us to do these calculations in the CSS, is that you can mix variables and mix length units. 
So I've got three boxes here which have an element nested inside. And I'm defining a height for each of them. The first takes the height of the content, so it's whatever the content is. Um, the second's got an absolute height in pixels, and the third it has a height in M's that increases on hover. Now, because I've positioned the div inside using um, absolute positioning, and I've positioned it from the bottom with 20 pixels, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the height of it using calc. I'm going to say make it 50% the height of the container, but take away that 20 pixels, which will mean it's always half of the height. And so we get this. And where this sort of thing is useful is doing stuff like positioning a background image from the bottom right, because background images are always positioned from the left side, and they're quite difficult to get precise positioning. You can do that with calc. And there's various other bits and pieces. If you need to mix your length units, it's very, very useful. Again, pretty good browser support. So I thought I'd finish up with a couple of features that have come into CSS really in response to stuff that we've been doing uh, for a long time with JavaScript. So we've got this new value of the position property, and that's sticky. So sticky positioning is something we've done with JavaScript. It's, what you're doing is you have an element, say a navigation bar that's partway down the content, and you start scrolling, and it scrolls with the text, and then when it hits a certain point, often the top of the browser window, it stays there, and then the text scrolls underneath. So that's a really nice effect, a useful effect, and CSS is implementing this as a native thing rather than you having to do this with JavaScript. So here I've got a simple example. We've got um, a DL, we've got these elements, we've got some multi uh, DT elements and then multiple DD elements. What I'd like is the, the term, which is A, B, C, D. I'd like those to stay fixed when they hit the top of the screen and then it scroll and then when the next one comes along that will stick at the top of the screen. So we've got that markup and then all I say is right so the term position sticky top zero because I want it to be when it hits the top of the screen. If I used a value there then it could be further down if you wanted to have it spaced out and we get this sort of thing which is quite nice. Um, it is coming into Chrome which is good news so Quite a lot of people are going to have this. It's obviously something that you can polyfill, because we've already been doing this with JavaScript, so you could polyfill it. There's a couple of polyfills out there. I think Filament Group have got one. Um, or you could just leave it as it is, because that would be absolutely fine without any polyfilling. It would work fine you know, for the people who don't see it, and some people would get the extra nice effect. Um, position sticky is not going to do anything if the browser doesn't support it. So that's quite a nice thing to be doing. And here's another thing. This is something that we try and do with JavaScript. It's actually quite hard to do. Scroll snapping is this thing where if you're scrolling through some sort of interface, so you've got some sort of image slider or whatever, um, as you sort of get over a certain point, it snaps to the next screen, which is a really nice effect. And it can help make things more kind of app-like in a way if you're trying to create something that's going to work a bit more like a mobile app. And there's a new CSS specification that does this. Um, the spec is at candidate recommendation status, so it's essentially complete. However, it very, very recently changed. And so the code that works in browsers is now different to the code which actually that they'll update to ultimately when they're following the spec. Um, I tried to find out a bit whether, how everyone's getting on with that and, and couldn't really find anything out, but hopefully we'll see people update. So as I say, I'm showing you something which is slightly different to what is now spec. So we've got this patchy browser support um, for the older implementation. So if you do try and use this up in production, be aware that it might change. But So this currently works in Firefox. The changes to the spec will actually lose the scroll snap points and uh, X and scroll snap destination. And what happens is that scroll snap type um, is going to use whether it's X or Y. But it's, it's roughly the same sort of idea. So we do this. We can say scroll snap type mandatory. And if my animation runs, we get this. So you see as you're trying to drag it, and you'll try and drag it, and then eventually it'll snap over as you get over that midway point, and you can play with that later. And we can do the same on the um, y-axis. Again, this is the old spec. Um, and we get, again, the scrolling like that. 
it's pretty nice as if it doesn't work you're going to get regular scrolling um, or again you could polyfill it which people are already doing that sort of thing with JavaScript it's how we've been doing that sort of stuff so I've shown you a whole bunch of stuff that's pretty new and um, some of it only works in one browser some of it works in all the browsers but one and I've also shown you how CSS is giving us a method to deal with this, so we can start to use things perhaps earlier than you might think um, and ensure that you have a good experience for everyone, whether they've got this new feature or they haven't. Because, um, of course, they may wake up tomorrow and find that they have got the new feature with browsers being evergreen. But the thing is that as web developers, we can encourage browser vendors to give us the things that we want. We need to get out there and tell them we want the features. You know, if it's some of those things that do not work only in Edge, well, get to their user voice thing and vote them up. Tell them that you want them, because very few people are. And, you know, if browser vendors are looking out into the community and saying, well, nobody is asking for this, so why would we implement it? We can do something else instead. So if you like any of these features, if you have use cases for them, if you can see they would be solving problems, then Go and tell the browser vendors directly where you've got a method to do so, but also write about them, talk about them. You know, write stuff up on your blog or on Medium, talk about them on Twitter, ask why we don't have them. Because I can tell you that, you know, any browser vendor is looking out there to the community and seeing, is there any interest in this feature? Should we do it? Is it going to give us a good win? Are web developers going to be pleased if they see this thing has arrived in browsers? And write up your use cases. Say, this is why I need this, not just because it's a really neat feature, but because it's going to solve this thing in the type of thing that I have to build. And also, you know, my CSS Working Group hat on. If you see any of these features and you believe that the CSS Working Group have completely lost the plot and that we haven't spotted something that's important to you, or you've got use cases that aren't being solved, then please, please, please write about that and let us know. You know, tell us what, what you really want to have in browsers. As you can see, Quite a few of these things are really a, a direct implementation of stuff that we, as the web development community, are doing anyway. You know, we want to do this stuff, and so now we're going to get it in CSS to make it easier and hopefully a lot more performant. Um, so comment on the stuff that's coming through, particularly the things that are just at working draft stage. You can actually make a change to those specifications. It's got a lot easier recently because all of the specifications for CSS are now on GitHub, just like any open source project. So you can go, you can search the issues. There's a bunch of stuff in there where the CSS working group are basically saying, what should we call this feature? Because we don't know. And it may well be that you've got a good idea from the background you've got, your training or the things that you know, you, you kind of know what that should be called or what would make sense. Um, so do come and have a look at the, the issues. You can raise your own. If you think, you know, Flexbox should do this. Well, you know, at some point, a level two of the Flexbox spec is going to be written, and it may well be that those ideas can get in there. Um, you know, we can all uh, be part of making these specs better. Um, and so I'd really like to see, and as someone who's on the working group as an independent, you know, I'm not tied to a browser vendor, really I feel that my remit is to take the ideas that we have as a community and get them in front of the working group so you can all help me by writing up your use cases and let me know about them, because I'll be very happy to make sure those things get discussed. So on that note, I'll finish up and you will find slides, resources and links to all the code pens there. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day.